He was a rebel and innovator, both on screen and off. A two-time Oscar winner who was probably the most influential actor in movie history. Marlon Brando all but reinvented the art form. But his eccentricities and erratic onset behavior, clashes with co-stars and studios, and tendencies towards self-parody led to much public scrutiny and tabloid fodder. Still, his legacy is best summed up as maybe the greatest actor ever and a champion for numerous social causes. We remember Marlon Brando. Born in Nebraska in 1924, Marlon Brando had a rough childhood, growing up under two alcoholic parents. His mother was an actress and passed along that trait to her children, including young Marlon. The bad boy image of Marlon Brando, too, began early. Before entering a military academy, Brando faced expulsion at his high school for riding a motorcycle through the hallways serving as foreshadowing to one of his most famous roles. Brando went to New York to study acting and theater under Stella Adler, proponent of the Stanislavski system of acting, which highlighted the art of experiencing. This isn't to be directly confused with method acting, which Brando denied involvement with. Brando always gave Adler credit. Quote, Stella Adler was much more than a teacher of acting. Through her work, she imparts the most valuable kind of information, how to discover the nature of our own emotional mechanics and therefore those of others. Brando made his Broadway debut in 1944 to much acclaim. It was here he first displayed what would become a dominating trait, his clashing with co-stars. Here, Tallulah Bankhead, who disliked the actor's style and mannerisms, would inadvertently give Brando his biggest break, calling him a total pig of a man without sensitivity or grace of any kind. In other words, perfect for the role of Stanley Kowalski, the lead character in the stage adaptation of A Streetcar Named Desire for director Elia Kazan. Thanks for watching We Remember. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. Now, back to the show. Brando's big screen debut was 1950's The Men, playing a paraplegic World War II vet. Brando did his research, studying bedridden vets, and for it earned immediate acclaim. In a year that saw Academy Award nominations for Spencer Tracy as the titular father of the bride and James Stewart talking to an imaginary rabbit, Brando's debut marked a clear turning point in the art of acting. He would be snubbed by the Academy, but the next year, Brando would get his first of a near record seven Best Actor nominations. As Stanley Kowalski in the filmed version of A Streetcar Named Desire, Brando gives a raw, visceral performance that ranks as one of the most astounding ever put on screen. He earned his second nod for playing Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata in Zapata, back when Brownface was okay, apparently. Brando would also go yellowface in The Tea House of the August Moon. Still, Brando was devoted to his performance, studying his subject and the culture thoroughly. Next came Julius Caesar, in which he played against traditionally trained Brits James Mason, John Gilgland, and more. Director John Huston said his emergence was like a furnace door opening. His next film would hit an entirely different market. Although his fifth film, the following exchange seemed the perfect introductory line to the actor. Hey Johnny, what, what are you, are you rebelling, rebelling against? against? What do you got? As the leather jacket clad teen tough, seemingly not far off from the youth who got suspended for tearing through his high school on two wheels, Brando helped usher in the greaser era. Brando's remarkable run in the 1950s hit its pinnacle with 1954's On the Waterfront, partly an interpretation of director Ilya Kazan's naming of names of former communists during the McCarthy witch hunt. For his turn as conflicted former boxer Terry Malloy, Marlon Brando won his first Oscar, 
after three previous nominations in just five films, becoming the youngest winner in the category. It's considered one of his greatest performances and one of the finest ever committed to film. It marked a genuine shift in what acting could be. Never had such a style of acting been bestowed such an honor. Later, Brando would attribute his talents to a suppressed childhood. Quote, My emotional insecurity as a child, the frustrations of not being allowed to be who I was, of wanting love and not being able to get it, of realizing that I was of no value, may have helped me as an actor. Guys and Dolls proved that singing was most certainly not Brando's strong suit. I couldn't hit a note with a baseball bat, he said, and that he could butt heads with nearly anyone on set, including Frank Sinatra. The rift between Brando and Old Blue Eyes may stem from Sinatra almost getting on the waterfront, but it hit hard during production with Sinatra calling Brando mumbles and showing a clear hatred for his style of acting. Following The Fugitive Kind, his second Tennessee Williams adaptation after A Streetcar Named Desire, Brando directed his only feature, One-Eyed Jacks, subbing for a reportedly fired Stanley Kubrick. It was a noted disaster that went over budget and lost money upon release, not to mention being yanked away by the studio. It would mark the beginning of a long stretch of lowlights for the actor. Brando's reputation with the studios hit an all-time low during the making of Mutiny on the Bounty, a notable Hollywood disaster faced with a ballooning budget, production schedule, and star. Of course, this wasn't the first time Brando was difficult, but it did indicate to the press and the public what he could be like on set. There followed a string of duds critically, commercially, and creatively. The Ugly American, co-starring Sister Jocelyn, which earned him a Golden Globe nomination on recognition alone. Bedtime Story, later remade as the far superior Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. A Countess from Hong Kong for Charlie Chaplin, whose style drastically clashed with Brando's, who later called him a fearsomely cruel man and reflections in a golden eye as a man confronting his own homosexuality. Brando was widely known to be bisexual. There were a few strong films, like 1966's The Chase and the politically charged Burn, which Brando cited as a personal favorite and later said, quote, I did some of the best acting I've ever done in that picture but the 1960s had inarguably been a disaster for Brando's movie career. Still, the decade was no time lost. Brando's political and social activism was dominant. He became involved with such movements in the 1940s, notably with Zionist Ergen, but seemed to put most of his focus in the turbulent 1960s. As he wrote in his autobiography, quote, I have been looking for a way to repair myself from the damages I suffered early on and to define my obligation, if I had any, to myself and my species. He was a close associate and friend of Martin Luther King Jr., participating in the 1963 March on Washington and attending that event's I Have a Dream speech. After MLK's assassination, Brando continued using his star power to spread the word and find answers. He, too, was a friend of the Black Panthers, even speaking at the funeral of Bobby Hutton, a 17-year-old killed by police. He had always been a champion for racial injustice, even on screen, perhaps most notably with the doubleheader of The Tea House of the August Moon and Sayonara, both of which featured interracial relationships. But activism doesn't equate the box office success and so Paramount wanted nothing to do with Marlon Brando in the 1970s, partly due to the One-Eyed Jacks debacle. After an infamous screen test, in which Brando stuffed cotton balls in his cheeks, the actor won the role of Don Vito Corleone in Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather, beating out the likes of George C. Scott, Lawrence Olivier, and Ernest Borgnine. That is, under the condition that he take a lowered salary and not cause a single delay in production. For his performance, another consistently ranked as one of the greatest ever, 
Marlon Brando won his second Oscar, for which he graciously accepted. Uh, actually, in one of the earliest controversies at the Academy Awards, the actor refused to accept the statue. Instead, as Brando, a supporter of the American Indian movement, was lending his time and efforts to the Wounded Knee occupation, he sent indigenous actress Sachin Littlefeather to the stage to speak and publicly criticize, quote, the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry. Interestingly, one of the actors Brando beat out, George C. Scott, became the first actor to refuse an Oscar just two years prior. Next was Bernardo Bertolucci's Last Tango in Paris, controversial in his time for its sexuality and contemporarily for the reported treatment of co-star Maria Schneider, who later stated she felt, quote, a little raped. It's a remarkable performance from Brando, giving one of his most emotional and textured turns as a man mourning his wife, engaging in a dalliance with a stranger, and almost single-handedly ruining butter for everyone. On the set, Brando utilized one of his staple tricks, hiding his lines on the set. Here, he requested to have them written on his co-star's rear end. Whew, glad he didn't do that on the island of Dr. Moreau. The Missouri Breaks saw him reteaming with Arthur Penn for the first time in a decade and playing alongside Jack Nicholson, who also had a house on Mulholland Drive, nicknamed Bad Boy Drive, for what should be obvious reasons. Although a flop upon release, it now has a bit of a cult following. Brando ended the 1970s with two of his strangest endeavors and biggest paydays, both in films hazed in production chaos. For two weeks of work and what amounted to under 20 minutes of screen time, Brando earned $3.7 million and 11.75% of the box office for Superman, playing Jor-El, Superman's father. Brando brought along a few quirky ideas with him, like suggesting he only voice his character and that Jor-El actually not be a man but a bagel. He also took a new spin on his cue card shenanigans by having the lines written on baby Superman's diaper. Brando was supposed to be in Superman 2 as well, but due to butting heads with the studio over his demanded salary, percentage points, and unpaid money to the tune of $50 million, and Brando's subsequent lawsuit, the studio cut his scenes. They would unearth in the 2006 Richard Donner cut, with permission from his estate, while Brando's Jor-El would be resurrected for that same year's Superman Returns through archival footage and CGI. In Apocalypse Now, Brando played the rogue Colonel Kurtz. For three weeks of work, Brando earned $2 million, plus 10% of the gross and another 10% of the TV rights. Not bad, considering he showed up unfamiliar with the script and so overweight and bald that Coppola had to hide Kurtz in dark clothes and shadows. Despite good behavior on The Godfather, Coppola should have figured this may happen, considering Brando's history of odd tendencies and being voted least cooperative actor in 1961. He also didn't mesh with one of his few co-stars, Dennis Hopper, taking Brando's number of onset feuds to, oh, probably about a hundred or so. That's not even including the one with Burt Reynolds, circling the role of Michael Corleone in The Godfather, who Brando called the epitome of everything that is disgusting about the thespian. What, the cop and a half guy? Other than 1989's A Dry White Season, for which he earned his final Oscar nod, and only one in the supporting category, and allowed him to narratively explore another issue close to him, apartheid in South Africa, Brando's post-Apocalypse Now output was pretty scarce and unremarkable. There was 1990's The Freshman, which hinged on him looking like Don Corleone, 1995's Don Juan DeMarco, where he played opposite an idolizing Johnny Depp, the two bonded over, of all things, farts, and 1996's The Island of Dr. Moreau, where he was nominated for Worst Screen Couple alongside this hideous thing and earned a reputation as a monster from the film's screenwriter. His final film was 2001's The Score, a 
a strong heist movie improved only by the fact that Brando clashed with one final collaborator, his director Frank Oz, who he reportedly refused to work in the same room with and constantly referred to as Miss Piggy, Oz's longtime Muppet. The performances Marlon Brando left behind are paramount to movie history. One wonders, too, what he would have done with the various other roles he had been considered for. Two that went to James Dean, sometimes criticized as a Brando wannabe. Drug drama The Man with the Golden Arm, where he was beat out by Guys and Dolls nemesis Frank Sinatra. The title character in Ben-Hur and The Big Lebowski. Harry Callahan in Dirty Harry, a role that Clint Eastwood milked for a five movie run. Lawrence of Arabia, although he opted to do Mutiny on the Bounty instead, saying, I'll be damned if I'll spend two years of my life on some fucking camel. And who can forget the unreleased Big Bug Man, where Brando voiced an elderly woman named Mrs. Sour. At the time of recording, Brando was on oxygen and so recorded all of his dialogue in small sessions at his home. Marlon Brando died the following month, on July 1st, 2004, from respiratory failure, with fights with pulmonary fibrosis and liver cancer. For much of his life, Brando tried to be as secluded to the public eye as possible, even to eccentric levels, as when he bought a private Polynesian island, since turned into a resort called, yes, the Brando, which is about as symbolic as it gets. Of course, the media and paparazzi would never allow this, and it's at least partly because of them that Brando had his tough guy image. In one instance, he broke paparazzo Ron Galela's jaw. The next time they encountered each other, Galela wore a protective football helmet. Still, the behaviors and eccentricities were an obsession for most of his career. Brando was a punchline as early as the 1950s, stemming most directly from a Truman Capote piece. I don't know, but we're betting Brando could take Capote in a fight. In the 1960s, famed critic Pauline Kael noted that he had already fallen into self-parody. Their critiques went deeper than that, with takes on his purported affairs, both hetero and homosexual, with romances supposedly as wide-ranging as Marilyn Monroe and Richard Pryor. He had three marriages and 11 children, two of whom would prove susceptible to tabloid fodder, son Christian shot and killed his sister Cheyenne's boyfriend in 1990, and Cheyenne committed suicide in 1995. Why wouldn't the media focus on the more positive aspects of his personal life, like his patent for tuning conga drums? Despite any acclaim and accolades both in his time and after his death, the American Film Institute named him the fourth greatest male movie star and Time called him one of the most important people of the century, to cite just two. Brando had a mysterious disdain for the craft that adds to his persona and lore. Quote, If a studio offered to pay me as much to sweep the floor as it did to act, I'd sweep the floor. Fortunately, Marlon Brando took to the screen and not the janitor's closet. It's said that in the art of acting, there is before Brando, and after Brando. But in actuality, the more fitting phrase may be forever Brando. <laughs> <laughs>